Okay, hello everybody and welcome to our town hall meeting. We're actually having technical difficulties with our ASL interpreter for today's event, so I'm really sorry about that. However, we do have live captioning available, so if you are tuning in via Facebook, YouTube, or SPS TV, there are live captions in English on the screen for you. If you're tuning in via Teams Live, you can turn on live captions in English, and we have a few translated captions options as well. Um, you can do that on Teams Live by hovering over the screen, selecting the three ellipses at the bottom of the screen, and then select Live Captions. Um, today, I'm joined by Chief Academic Officer, Dr. Keisha Scarlett, Emergency Management Specialist, Benjamin Coulter, and interagency high school teacher Jay Conley to share updates and to answer questions around outdoor and community learning. I'm super excited to have them um, share more about this work. It's been a big lift for the district and a lot of moving pieces. Um, our staff worked really hard and we're working really hard to bring more students back in person while also protecting the health and safety of our community. So outdoor and community learning is an incredibly innovative way for educators to support in-person learning opportunities. Right now we're piloting outdoor education programs in select schools. We do look forward to more teachers applying to participate. Um, there are ways that um, our educators can apply to have this opportunity. And so we've sent that out several times and we'll make sure that gets out there again. So we, you know, I encourage everybody take a look at it and I think after you hear what's going on in outdoor ed today you'll kind of be excited about it. Um, in addition to outdoor learning we're getting ready to bring back pre-k um, through first grade students and students being served in special education intensive pathways as early as March 1st. And we're working with our labor partners at Seattle Education Association to prepare for a phased in approach for a return to in-person services. Negotiations are ongoing and we are prioritizing our first phase to be focused on special education intensive service pathways starting in March. Conversations continue about how to best support pre-K through first grade students um, and our staff while adhering to safety protocols and prioritizing consistency of teachers for our youngest learners. We know that we will need to have smaller cohorts of students averaging around a 15 to 1 ratio and families that choose to continue remote learning will be offered that option. Um, as you can imagine, there are numerous logistics to work through and I really appreciate SCA's commitment and engagement in this process. Along with our educators, district staff are committed to providing high quality learning for all of our students, no matter the circumstances. And we will continue to listen to our staff, families, and students and respond to our community's needs. This includes advocating for vaccines for educators and all school-based staff that will be supporting the increase in in-person learning. Earlier this month, I sent a letter to Governor Inslee and our state public health officials asking them to prioritize vaccinations for public, educator, public educators and our critical support staff. The Department of Health has done just that, sending a strong mes message of the state's commitment to public education and to our educators. This means that all school employees are eligible in phase 1B or earlier in the revised vaccine schedule. But we're also hoping to stay nimble in our response to the ever-changing nature of the pandemic. As the new vaccine rollout plans are being announced statewide and nationally, we will, keep, we will work to keep our staff and families informed. Um, while staff will be rece receiving priority vaccines, um, distribution locations have already changed. We'll share a link in the chat to learn more about um, the vaccine eligibility and how to register at a clinic convenient for you. Every plan that is created and every decision that is made during the pandemic has to be flexible. The spread of the virus and our community's response and how other organizations react also affects Seattle Public Schools. We'll continue to keep everyone informed of the latest, also knowing that things may be subject to change. Another key priority in our planning for a return to buildings is predictability and consistency. Our families shared how important it was for students to remain with their current teacher as we transitioned to in-person instruction. 
we heard you. We are talking in depth about an approach that keeps classroom communities together as we transition more students back into buildings. And we will continue to keep you updated as we bargain with our labor partners. In the meantime, uh, we remain committed to providing high quality instruction remotely. Educators and staff are now preparing for Black Lives Matter at school week from February 4th through 8th. Our schools, as usual, will be participating in a multitude of ways. Public education systems and educators have an important role to play in disrupting legacies of racism. Declaring Black Lives Matter at school affirms our commitment to all of our students. As we prepare for this important week, it's also important to remember <coughs> that at Seattle Public Schools, the lives and lived experiences of our Black youth matter. Hold, oh, please. <clears throat> the lives and lived experiences of our Black youth matter, <clears throat> not just during Black Lives Matter at School Week or Black History Month, but every single day. <clears throat> and I'll pass it over to Chief Academic Officer, Dr. Keisha Scarlett, to share more about outdoor learning and community education. Welcome, Dr. Scarlett. Thank you. Thank you, Superintendent Juno. Thank you for having us here today to discuss outdoor learning. So outdoor learning is a new concept in Seattle Public Schools, but we've had successful models around Seattle and Washington. With remote learning due to COVID pandemic, we have had to get really creative in order to engage students in learning since we can't be together in our school buildings. So as a result, board members Liza Rankin, Chandra Hampson, and Brandon Hersey put forth a resolution to implement outdoor learning pilots this school year that will inform how the district can move forward with its own outdoor learning program. Educators and school building principals can apply to start their own pilots. The application process gives educators and principals an opportunity to present their ideas for an outdoor learning class and helps them th think through operational details such as accessibility, transportation, bathroom access, hand washing, social distancing, and other important safety measures that will be discussed in just a couple of minutes. If the pilot is approved, the outdoor learning program can begin. If it is not approved, educators and principals have the opportunity to revise their pilot application with the guidance from the district and our health and safety team. Pilot applications will be accepted throughout the school year. These pilots will help inform the outdoor and community education task force so they can put recommendations together on how to start an outdoor and community education program in Seattle Public Schools. I'll now pass it over to Jay Conley, who is a courageous educator at Interagency High School, who will be leading an outdoor learning pilot. Welcome, Jay. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I'm Jay Conley. I'm the CTE teacher at Interagency. Interagency is an SPS alternative high school made up of small campuses across Seattle. We work with students who have not been well served by a traditional high school model. And as a CTE teacher, I teach uh, hands on career skills and applied math. I first heard that SPS was accepting teacher proposals for outdoor programs this fall, right around the same time that the SCWA, which is Seattle's project labor agreement was announced. Um, the SCWA will require contractors working with Seattle Public Schools projects to hire qualified students, alumni, and also SPS family members. Uh, we're excited for what the SCWA will mean for interagency because our school community includes many talented construction workers who've had trouble accessing prevailing wage work. Interagency already had an outdoor welding classroom in what was previously a covered play court. So I put together a proposal based on expanding that space into a pre-apprenticeship and applied math program. Interagency's outdoor pilot program is building trades pre-apprenticeship and applied math uh, with students from six of our campuses. The program is an opportunity for students who are interested in construction careers to build foundational math skills 
and also to learn more about post-secondary training opportunities in various trades. Students work outdoors at our main campus in small cohorts, two hours, two days per week. Um, the first hour is focused on applied math. So um, they're, they're learning such as 3G geom 3D geometry, structural trussing, and basic trigonometry takes place in welding. And uh, learning like pattern development, scales, volumes, and layout is taught through sheet metal. Students also use our gantry crane rigging kit to learn about uh, concepts like center of gravity calculations, leverage, fulcrums, crush force, and load distribution. The second hour that they're in program is spent on weekly hands-on trades exploration modules, such as uh, structural framing, pipe threading and soldering, electrical wiring, water abatement, or mechanical systems. The second hour is also when they work on their industry recognized certificates. Uh, students can earn their forklift driving certification in our training yard and also are working on their OSHA 10 safety certification. <clears throat> working outdoors allows students to familiarize themselves with the weather related logistics of construction work and um, risk management and safety planning are critical skills for any construction worker. So the combination of COVID-19 safety protocols and the industry required safety equipment that we use in the outdoor education program is great job skills development for these students. Uh, I'm hopeful that this program will launch careers and that our graduates will find uh, instruction industry both rewarding and challenging. And our OSHA 10 safety certification. Working outdoors allows students to familiarize themselves with the weather Related I would pass off to Benjamin Coltier. Okay. Risk management and safety planning are critical skills for any. All right, industry. thank you, Jay. So the I'm combination. Benjamin Coulter, emergency management specialist from the safety and security department. I'm going to talk a little bit about health and safety and operations. Why do operations matter with education? Well, we know you can enjoy the learning experience if you have to worry about how things work and whether or not you're safe. So we have an operations team that reviews these matters when it comes to outdoor learning. We really appreciate the hard work of our health and services department, health services department, just as our health workers have been working so hard in hospitals in our community and in public health departments. Seattle Public Schools Health Services has been working incredibly hard as well, and they've developed guidelines for in person learning that every family can read about on the Seattle Schools website. You've got a link there that says a return to in-person FAQ and it's a little blue schoolhouse with an orange roof. Click on that link and you can see all the different guidelines that the school district is operating by for our different programs when, they're in, when there are in-person services. Now for outdoor learning in particular, we have a team that comes out and that team represents people involved with operations. Uh, some will be involved with the educational side. We'll have folks representing custodial or facilities possibly nutrition services, uh, transportation, myself from safety and security, to take a look at what the vision for the site is, how, how we adapt these guidelines to the outdoor space. What do we think about? Well, really the same things we're all thinking about every day in staying safe from COVID-19. What's the first thing we learned about in this pandemic? Social distancing. So one of the first things the team looks at when we get there is, what space is going to be used? Usually there are canopies perhaps or a tent to protect from rain. How do we keep that space covered? And how do we maintain the six feet for the teachers and students who are participating in the program during the length of the program? The next thing we're going to look at realistically is personal protective equipment or PPE. Now we know a lot of people mostly have their favorite type of mask. Here's mine with Mount Rainier on it. But we know that as a school district, we need to make masks available, face covering. So we have our disposable masks ready. So the question is, how are the masks going to be provided to students who need them? Where are we going to keep the gloves, the hand sanitizer? Those are being ordered through the custodian, but where will they be in the scope of the outdoor learning area? Finally, we want to talk about hand washing, uh, hand, uh, cleaning, hygiene, what is the standard for wiping down surfaces before and after or during the program, depending on what's happening? What restrooms will be used? Where can hands be washed? 
Uh, we want to make sure that this is in a way that minimizes building use. And if there's any other programs in the building happening at the school, perhaps in person special education services, something like that, we want to make sure that different restrooms are used absolutely whenever possible. After all these things are figured out, there's in person training from a school nurse with the families that will be attending and with the staff that will be working at the program. Of course, part of that is talking about what we call attestation or health screening. We do health screening right now for staff electronically and for students, we're doing it on paper. They'll do paper, what we call attestation or health screening, verifying that they don't have any symptoms and are healthy, to, healthy enough to be there at the class that day. Right now, SPS is working very hard on creating an electronic system that families and students can use it as well. What are we thinking about from a safety point of view and security point of view? Well, we're just looking at things from the idea of similar to uh, playground safety or physical education safety. Um, what is the grounds like? What is the happening across the street? And how are we making sure that our students stay safe while they're outside, possibly interacting with other things in the community and neighborhood and the weathers? After we've had this review and the operation plan is put together, we're ready to go and school can be in session without being terribly concerned about these things because they're in place and everyone can focus on their learning. Back to Superintendent Juno for the questions and answers. Great, thanks everybody. And as you can see from you know all uh, the information that's been presented, it, there are a lot of moving pieces and we of course keep um, health and safety uh, a priority in all the decision making. And so thank you, Benjamin, for everything you're doing. And thank you to everybody for providing this opportunity for our students. It's pretty exciting. Um, I guess there's uh, some questions coming in. Um, and so I know Dr. Scarlett, these first couple that you might be able to handle is just tell a little bit more about the application process for the outdoor pilots, why are they so complex? And I think we heard a little bit about why right now, um, but also, so why are they so complex? And then how are those reviewed over time when somebody submits something? Absolutely. So, um, you know, I know that it could be perceived that the application process is really complex, um, but this is really a multi-level sort of approach um, to um, being able to have that outdoor learning um, opportunity. So um, teams come together and they um, fill out applications and um, give an action plan that's based upon specific criteria um, in order to um, lift up these pilots and get them started. Some of the things that we're looking for is, um, of, of, or of course, having basic um, safety um, processes and procedures in place. Um, Another area that we're looking at is also how students furthest from educational justice are impacted by these um, outdoor pilots. That um, our strategic plan um, clearly um, sets a focus on pursuing racial justice. And so um, are these culturally responsive opportunities um, for students to be able to engage in? Um, and then there's the health and safety protocols that need to be um, in place that teams need to think through ahead of time. And so the applications come and then they're reviewed. Um, right now they're reviewed by um, a team of um, people. There um, will be further review um, when we have the outdoor task force um, that is launched. But right now a team of central office and school directors and um, also um, some other um, SCA members look at the applications and give um, you know, their feedback about the feasibility of the plan. Um, teams receive feedback. They may receive feedback for adjustments and there's a discussion period. And then there's actually a site, a site visit that is scheduled where a large team um, of folks go out to the school site. We look at the um, space, see if it's suitable. We have, it's a multi-people multi, um, people from safety um, and our health and safety from the instruction department. We all come together and converge on the site and ask questions of the um, team as well. So um, once an application goes through the initial just review, the next step is the school site visit. And then once that is completed and um, we feel um, certain that all the safety protocols will be followed, then um, that final approval um, is, is moved forward. So it is complex, but um, this is an important time um, for us to make sure that we have really safe opportunities for our students. Yeah, that's great. Thank you for that. Um, and it's exciting, it's an exciting opportunity. Um, there are some like 
very nitty gritty detailed questions. And I think Benjamin, these are probably for you of just like, what are the requirements for bathrooms and hand washing stations? Like when you go in to survey a area for an outdoor education pilot, like what are those things you're looking at? I wouldn't say that there's a hard requirement that would stop us from using a particular restroom, a hand washing sink, as long as they do the water works and the toilet works and everything. But the thing we're really focused on is that it's convenient for the program and it's not going to be used by anybody who's not involved with the program in the building. That's really the main thing we're focusing on and strategizing. So hopefully it's a restroom that perhaps is right inside an exterior door that is very close to the program. Maybe it's even an outside facility, but that's really the, the requirement is that we try to keep it just for the students who are working and staff who are working with the outdoor program. And I, I'm not sure who this question goes to, but like say, I know we do the attestations and we're sort of um, asking if people have symptoms, but if somebody sort of comes down with COVID, what's the protocols at that point? Well, if we see symptoms, then the, we have a, a, de, a designated protected health area. So the student, if they're very young, would wait in that area. If they're perhaps teenage and older where they get themselves to school, they could see themselves home. And then any student that was within six feet for 15 minutes or more of that person who had symptoms, would their family would get a notification. And of course, our contact tracing team from health services would then work to see when that uh, person gets a COVID test. Is it confirmed that they had COVID? They follow through. And of course, as we mentioned before about social distancing, we're really trying to strategize to make it where it's highly unlikely that you are within six feet of someone else during this program for 15 minutes or more and really minimizing the chance of that happening if someone does have those symptoms. Mr. Conley, do you want to tell us a little bit about your experience of shifting to outdoor ed? I know that you were engaged in this type of um, education setting before and just what that means to you as an educator to have students in your space and then how they have um, how they've reacted to being back in person a little bit. Sure, um, I've been pleasantly surprised how eager students are to work with the protocols because they really want to be in the company of their peers. Um, I have students working in separated booths that are eight by 12 spaces, but I encourage teamwork through using loud voices, which is also industry appropriate in construction. You gotta be able to yell to the folks around you in a noisy environment. And um, I've been surprised how well collaborations have gone in spite of the social distance. Um, and it's been really life giving for me to be back teaching students in person. Yeah, that's great. And then if you know, an in inclement weather, so how, how are you dealing with the rain that comes in Seattle and a little bit of chilly? Sure, um, we have our applied math component in a former play court area. So we've got a roof and an open chain link wall that's 100 feet by 20 feet. Yeah, that's great. And then if you know an in inclement weather, so how, how are you dealing with the rain that comes in Seattle and a little bit of chilly? Sure, um, we have our applied math component in a former play court area. So we've got a roof and an open chain link wall that's 100 feet by 20 feet. So the wind is coming in, but uh, we have been supported by the with infrared heaters at the workstations like you might see at a restaurant with patio service. And so we have those at the individual workstations where students are working with sheet metal. It keeps your head and hands warm. They're well outfitted. They have welding jackets and um, we've got lots of uh, materials for them to keep comfortable. The second part of the day, sometimes we are in the rain. We're driving to forklift um, and we're doing building modules outside, but we have a pop-up tent that the students sort of can erect as a team and uh, work under and we've created separate workstations out there as well. That's awesome. Dr. Scarlett, when the board passed um, the resolution for outdoor and community education, there was a component that was to establish a task force. Do you wanna just give an update on where we are with that task force and sort of what their charge is going to be over time? Because this isn't gonna end, right? It's sort of like, we're gonna continue kind of 
looking at outdoor education and what that might look like in the future. And so just want to give update on that and what kinds of things they might be thinking about. Yes, so we've been quickly moving to um, establish the task force and to have um, really great representation, to have um, student representation and family representation as well as, um, you know, central office and staff and SCA representation on this. And, um, you know, the intention of this, these outdoor learning pilots is to pilot something that is feasible for ongoing. We believe that all students can benefit from outdoor um, education um, learning opportunities. And so even though COVID-19 is what sort of precipitated this opportunity, we don't want you to just think that we're just having school outside, that we really do want to think about the best practices of outdoor learning. So this team will be doing research and bringing in um, experts. They'll be doing um, their own visits um, in some ways and reviewing the data that's coming back from the different um, pilots and then using that um, in order to build um, some scale around this. And so the pilot applications will continue to come in. Um, we have right now um, five um, area five um, sites, um, including interagency that are approved pilots, but we also have some in the queue um, and have some that are um, that their um, application needs to be revised. So this we meet every week um, and go through the list and look at um, new proposals and um, move them through the process for approval um, on this. And so we really want our educators to be inspired. Um, we're also reaching out to community-based organizations, um, particularly to those that serve um, students furthest away from education, uh, furthest from educational justice, um, to think about what are the opportunities for partnership as well, because we um, believe that there are a lot of community partners um, who would love to be a part of this. And we've been doing outdoor education for a while. When I was a principal at South Shore, we had a partnership with, um, with Seattle Tilt and we had an urban farm that our students um, worked um, um, you know, in, and it was part of um, from the grade level from pre-K all the way through eighth grade. So um, we do have models for this. And so we just need to use some creativity and little ingenuity in order to lift these things up. Yeah, and then just um, finally, can you uh, let people know how they find out more about these and when these outdoor education pilots or opportunities might open, like how do people know and then how do they get their child engaged with that type of learning? Yeah, I would reach out um, to your principal and ask, um, is there a pilot in the works? Um, that would be a first um, place to get started because they may just be going through an application process. Um, also, if you're interested um, in having your child um, participate, oh, please know that you know, you're not able to go to different schools sort of pilot. So if there's a neighboring school that has something really awesome, that probably won't be um, a place where you can have your own student enroll into. But I think it's also important, we want this to be a grassroots effort with our educators and families together. And so I think families can use some creativity um, and encourage and support educators and school teams to help lift these up as well. Um, for more information, um, there's a website, a web page um, that you can access in order to find out more information about the um, outdoor pilots and of course being part of these Q&As. And hopefully we'll have another update Q&A um, at some time um, on, um, on this live, on my team's live in order to just give you some updates about it as well. So stay tuned. Yep, stay tuned. Um, great work. Mr. Conley, I'm just going to ask you to have sort of the last word of this panel and like what would be your message out to educators who are thinking about what they might, what's possible outside and I know you mentioned how um, how fulfilling it was to have students back in person and be able to see them face to face and what, would you like what's your words of encouragement to educators out there who might want to engage in this sure um i would acknowledge that there's a lot of startup work to set it up and to get things in place um what i have found is a higher level of enthusiasm on the part of my students families than i've ever experienced before and I would encourage people to partner with students, parents and students um, from the very beginning in the planning stages. Um, and I've also found a whole community of folks who can support the learning that we're doing within the parents of my students and uh, people have an uncle who knows a lot about it. Um, I, I would encourage educators not to be daunted by the task and to seek support from the folks around them. That's awesome. Thank you. And thank you for everything you're doing for our students. And thank you, Benjamin, for making sure that people are staying safe and healthy and reviewing all and everything that you're doing for the district. And Dr. Keisha Scarlett, as always, 
Um, thank you for everything that and the leadership you're providing um, across the district. I just want to thank everybody for joining us today. If we weren't able to get to your question, we'll respond in the comments. We'll be hosting these virtual town halls more regularly leading up to our increase in in-person instruction on March 1st. And so please watch our social media sites, um, our emails, um, sign up for all of that communica communication that you can get. So thank you all so much for being here and um, appreciate it.